Our next speaker is uh, Nikos Trimiklinotis, who will talk about peace journalism, petition, and potential for overcoming austerity and chauvinist citizenship in Cyprus, using the examples of Cyprus and South Africa as tools for his argumentation. Nikos is a professor of sociology and social sciences at the University of Nicosia and head of team of experts of the Cyprus team for the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU. He's also a practicing barrister and has authored several articles, a list of which you can see in your program. Thank you very much. I would be addressing um, a, a subject which I think um, requires, uh, connects a lot of the debate we have heard of, um, and it draws on um, previous research we have done on the notion of critical peace in there of the, the, the public sphere uh, with Dimitris Trimitiotis. Uh, my paper at least entails the notion that there is a current reality, or at least a tendency uh, in the order of things uh, to reproduce what I have termed austerity and chauvinist citizenship in Cyprus. This warrants at least a brief explanation. I consider that the current condition, the citizenship uh, reflects to a large extent, to a critical extent, a hegemonic structure and discourse in the public sphere officially portrayed and reproduced uh, that has at its core, as its nucleus, um, which is uh, based on a logic, the logic of what uh, one Cypriot academic, Gustav Constantino, called the Cypriot states of exception. This is forcing uh, the logic of the ethnic divide onto the subject, an interpolation in the words of, as Arthur Sir would put it, that imposes a kind of this dual idea at the same time at the very heart of citizenship, national chauvinism, derived from the division and the neoliberal orthodoxy that is, that is stripping off all the welfare elements of the past, uh, that all welfare is potential in the past. Hence, uh, we have uh, the reality that we have in today. I'm just giving you some examples here about the austerity straitjacket and the kind of national chauvinism as apologetics for ethnic partitionism of, of the kind of the, the nationalist, different nationalist groups in Cyprus, which are more or less reproducing uh, the very notion of, of the way we understand citizenship. There are different wings of the same sort of logic of partitionism. Now, this, of course, means that uh, we are, um, this, um, this is nowhere to say that we have an absolutely successful project. I think that uh, the notion, I think Balibar spoke about uh, citizenship in flux, explains the reality. It is always an incomplete, com contradictory, contested project. It is riddled by all sorts of gaps, imperfections, and contradictions, and cracks that ruptures and, and, and generates potential spaces for resistance and potentialities for overcoming this. And this is where I'm coming from. And I'm glad to see Andreas Panayodu up there, who is here with us. I think he's uh, um, the, the, one of the foremost sociological theorists in Cyprus, the ultimate monitorial citizen activist, yes? Because um, in the various projects that he, that he has involved, and the current one that I spoke about a couple of weeks ago at the Respublica conference um, seminar, um, I think this is the, the manifestation that there is a collective alternative a kind of the production of monitorial citizenship inscribed and embedded in the actual practice of the Therian And I refer to this again and again because I think it's a very, very, very serious project whereby uh, um, the, uh, the collect, we're talking about the, the idea of bringing together the struggles, news reporting, representation, analysis, discussion points that generate space, that monitors, that effectively uh, encapsulates what is there to be discussed. And I think the other interesting side, which is something we heard from the debate before, 
is this idea that the gap or the, the, the binary between the professional and the activist actually merges in this, in the way that it's being produced. And I think it's a, it's a fascinating starting point because of, of the way it, it is being done. It is a common, in a common struggle that we can talk about. So we are seeing uh, the, the possible contesting of the hegemonic public sphere, uh, and we're seeing the potential in, in a society, a border society, again, Andreas Panayotu concept, whereby the liminality and the social struggles create a collective alternative. And the potential for resistance, digital, digital opportunities, and produces a commons. And at the same time, this is not something that is an easy ride through. It is uh, almost like a war. That's why I, call, I will talk about memory, memory wars in a moment, in, this, in the, protection, the, 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 the potential for a, a, a kind of a global separatism, transcommunal citizenship, is, is a very, very difficult project. Now, we know that this is not something that's just happening here, it's happening in many places, it's a global thing, and it's always a, a debate here about how we will see this notion of monetary citizen, which I find a, a fascinating concept, a great idea, and, I, and I'm really pleased that to see these connections taking place because of the, the way in which globalized and localized struggles actually connect in ways uh, that uh, reshape the whole struggle. So I think and there are heroes, and which are sometimes called heroes, in others in the context of the state, they're called public enemies, the names are there. Um, and I think there is something to be done about the individual sort of heroes who are considered as individual acts of resistance and mass collective struggles here. And I think there is, a, there is something to be learned about the ways in which the two can actually work together. So at the same time, we need to see how to connect uh, the struggles in national context, when we're talking here about liberation and social struggles beyond boundaries. Let me now go zoom in to South Africa. Now, uh, this is where um, I, I have here the picture of Kabula, Fred Asprey Kabula, um, uh, a celebrated uh, poet who passed away in 2002 in South Africa's liberation and worker struggle. I was not fortunate enough to meet him, but I was fortunate enough to meet intellectual poets, sociologists, and, and activists uh, who had worked and struggled with him. Hence, if you like, this spirit of resistance, the fire that which defines um, an easy sociological definition, uh, but is somewhere there, the vibrancy and power that inspires to push society forward was something that I think was so much in the air that I think I still feel during my visit to South Africa, and in fact, this fire is, is still there when, when, when also in Cyprus. In this context, I think that if we are going to borrow this idea that uh, Kabula personified what Gramsci uh, regarded as an organic intellectual in the struggle, is how poetry and art uh, converge to create the possibilities of what we're talking about. I'm quoting here from Blake Zimander, who wrote the introduction to the book here. And uh, I think it is essential to anchor and probably root our reading and understandings within the traditions and struggles rather than simply superimpose our own beliefs onto content. Again, this idea is borrowed. I borrow this from uh, um, another South African poet and, and author and uh, sociologist, Arisitas, uh, who is engaged, who thinks that engaging in struggles as intellectuals is not something that is, should be taken lightly, but we should be reading this in the way the struggles are, are, are understood today. And uh, I think that uh, uh, I just want to uh, give you the, the picture of this. The world is turning, used to say, in, in this point. The struggle moves forward. We are not to lose strength. We die on the one side, we rise on the other, and continue. On, uh, on and on with our struggle until you become mad, a lunatic oppressor wearing the garlands of tree leaves on your head and trying to end off your life because the struggle continues, the wheel is turning, we move on. This is the sort of uh, push uh, that I think we, we could be thinking and, we try, and I try to capture. And this connects to this idea that uh, I think the monitorial citizen 
uh, and the idea of multicultural citizenship, such a useful concept, uh, is a democratic necessity, particularly after, uh, not just during struggles, but also after struggles are won. Because, uh, as, and this is a worker working in Dunlop uh, in, in Durban, in South Africa, so as workers fight for people to be promoted, all of a sudden, once they have been promoted, people throw stones at us, even comrades that we have deployed in Parliament are now throwing stone at us. So we have this contradiction, this idea, and I think earlier on we discussed the question of power and how this should be done and what should be done about it. And um, the question that needs to be addressed is, okay, but how do we connect different struggles in different contexts? And how does the South African reality connect to the Cypriot context? Well, I would argue that uh, Cypriots have always, you know, 30 years ago, were against apartheid, um, and this is just one example of a few of them demonstrating in London, uh, which, is, which shows that struggles do, do continue. But the question is really, can we really learn? What do we learn from struggles? How do we contextualize it without dogmatically mimicking it in a ridiculous sort of way? And we have seen a lot of that taking place. And I think we can, if we try and, and learn for instance, if we're looking at Cyprus as the question of transition as part of the social and political transformation, and the questioning of different debates that are relevant in different contexts, because we are seeing similar sort of debates that have to be contextualized and understood in this way. Uh, and if I was going to summarize a kind of a long debate about learning, I would say I would summarize it in kind of two key idea, again, uh, drawing from Aristides, who was just, uh, I think he was, he lived just a few hundred years, a few, a few hundred meters away from here, but now he's based in South Africa. Again, drawing on Cyprus after 2004 in a difficult point, he raised the point that we need, he asked the question, he didn't provide answers. And the question was about, what about the third spaces? What is the third space that generates dialogue of common action institutions for facilitating reconciliation in the future, reunited side. And this is at the heart of creating and recreating and reshaping our citizenship there, is locating this sort of space. And if Europe is not the space, because it is a, an imploding, faltering project, as we're seeing now today, uh, we need to locate these spaces, and I think this ideas of, deb of debating and connecting to um, the, the seeing uh, the notion of monitorial citizenship emerging creates these sort of spaces for that discussion to take place. The second point is contrary to uh, the, the idea that politics is an exceptional thing, it, it, it also has many supporters amongst the left as well as the right, and uh, the neo-Platonist, neo-Smithian approaches, I think what Ari has done in his work is to show us that ordinary people's lives and resistance in their lives does matter. And through that, we can understand. The same thing, thing that the same debates can be transferred onto the question of, of journalism. And I think what we're trying to discuss in peace journalism is how we, we should actually learn to, to connect uh, the ordinary part, the ordinary people to the sort of uh, understandings of the world in a, in a very different way. They can reshape, can reshape the whole way we understand journalism um, as, as an important point. Now, in the past, we have uh, discussed uh, this idea that uh, societies that are divided, societies that have faced conflicts, uh, need to reconnect and understand that uh, we need to understand the societies by addressing the social, political, and economic content of this idea. And we have tried to do this by critiquing the very notion of liberal peace and conflict resolution. And there are many problems with this idea of the ready-made formulas about how to produce peace. Just look around the corner, the products of liberal peace, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in Libya, whether it's in the whole region of the state. So th there's a critique there uh, emerging from the actual reality of the world we live in today. And I think this is what we're trying to do here. I'm not, I don't have time, I think, to deal with all the, the, the criticisms we have, we have raised, but I think it is these types of 
discussions that we need to undertake uh, in our construction, in our uh, um, discussions on how to resolve, for instance, the Cyprus problem, on how we should make, relate matters relating to, to Cyprus. <coughs> so, the issue is how can we learn from other struggles? And the, the whole point of my paper was how do we draw from, how do we learn, say, from po the post-apartheid struggles? And apartheid is supposed to have ended in, 2000, in 1994, but really, but didn't. Is it, is, are we seeing an apartheid um, uh, by other means? And I think these are just some of the key questions that, that have been addressed, have been raised in the post-apartheid reality. So it's reconstructing a non-racialized state, a society and economy in a globally neoliberal context. Uh, reconciliation, um, what about reconciliation? Torn, tormented past. And how does it deal with the, with the present? Mass inequality, housing, colonial remnants, class struggles, social movements, the politicizing of uh, things like AIDS and the disease and mobilizing citizens, everyday rapes and violence, uh, as well as corruption, state capture, and environmental challenges. Now, these are typical sort of questions that are based that uh, all divided societies, ethnically and racially divided, have to address. And I think we can learn from them. And uh, if we zoom to the present, if we look at today's uh, South Africa, uh, this is um, about memory wars. And I, I'm, I'm here, I here have a, a few pictures and a few images about Rose Must Fall. Uh, before it was Fees Must, must Fall, where students, and particularly students, but also others, decide to attack this issue. So anniversaries do not only concern the past, they also concern the future, and the, and, and the present as well as the future as we can see from this here. And again, more pictures of the mobilization. But this is not just a the thing. If you look at uh, the debate in, in, in the United States just a few months ago. Or if we just look around the corner, the, the, the sort of things that we're facing in Cyprus with rivers. There's a statue being built that has to kind of mobilize people instead of facing the rivers. Um, of course, Rivas, who was a Nazi collaborator and a hero for some, uh, he is receiving public, the public endorsement. Here we have the leader of, the, of the, the governing party. We have ministers who are actually seeing Rivas as the, as the kind of a key figure to be celebrated. We also have the neo-Nazis uh, in the memorial giving a, a, their, their branch in Cyprus, uh, Elan. Uh, the leader of the, of the leader of the neo-Nazis in Greece, Miharo Yagos, uh, here sending messages. And of course, the key idea here is that for, for the far right, which is posing as the far right vanguard of the nation, protecting the nation, is that we should not be talking to the Turkish Cypriots to reach a federal solution, which is the base of the agreement in Cyprus, because we need to protect the nation. So they're just, doing this, they're just making a step further from what the, the right wing and the nationalist agenda is talking about. And I think this is very important. But on the other side, and this is where monetary citizenship is crucial, we have the, 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 the other view. Down the rivers, no to the monument of shame, they say here, and mobilizing people. But it, it's a debate that is taking place, and it's not taking place. It's basically a monologue taking place uh, at the same time at different levels, but it does show that the past is here to, to, to haunt us in different ways. It's not just in Cyprus, I mean, this is in, in, in Istanbul, for instance, similar sorts of things have been vandalized. And the Turkish Cypriots in the north, these are the protests by the, the teachers who are actually radical and they're saying something very different. So the past beneath the present is the, the term borrowed by um, the, the historian um, Fleischer, Han, Han Fleischer, who talks about the way in which the symbolic world of memory kind of returning in ways that perhaps have been unanticipated. And I think this is a crucial moment in history where our present looks to the past in order to have to reshape the future. And I think citizenship plays a new role in these debates. And that's something which has not been properly thought of. And um, another a quote here from uh, Jalal Khatir, where he considered memory to be one of the most significant aspects of our humanity. Not because we should be uh, sacralizing memory, uh, but because memory and being is uh, coterminous.
the way we treat our memory, the memo in the memory of others, in the, of others in the present, uh, shapes the present or what defines our humanity. And I think this is a crucial thing that we should be thinking about in terms of thinking of alternatives or for the future. And, and if there is something to be thought about, uh, alternative envisioning, is how do we redress and how do we use journalism in a different way? And um, here, um, again, rethinking re about Cyprus and overcoming uh, the, the, the division of Cyprus and the potential for this. If we look back about the way in which we deal with the violence of the past, with the violent past, yet we have a situation whereby, and I talked about this at the last conference, 25% of Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots have friends in social media. And this is something to be thought of as the new third space, which creates the potential to be and to be more optimistic about how to overcome uh, the, the barriers that are there, language, but why to attack ideological and everyday. And uh, if we are going to think of, of, the, of the different aspects um, about how to address the question in the context of Cyprus and the, 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 the importance of, of the media in this, and the, particularly the a media that would recreate the public sphere, the new public sphere which is open, seeks peace and cooperation, um, to generate the sort of third space that Nari Sita was talking about, we need to think of the framework, uh, the normative and the legal framework, uh, and all the debates around participation that Nico spoke about earlier are, are, are a big thing. But how do we create conditions? How do we address professionalism, ethics, and sanctions? How do we address the, the, uh, the, the, the censorship question, uh, ownership and control of the media, and that sort of thing? And I think, uh, and I don't have much time because I, I'm talking on my last minute, I think there are three ways of dealing with this. One is to kind of have a frontal attack on the definition of the nature of the conflict. So this against the ethnicizing of the national alignment, creating conditions for political disagreement and de-ethnicization of politics. The frontal, frontal attack. The second thing is by contextualizing and relativizing. And the third, well, the third uh, idea is uh, thinking about uh, the transference and moving away from the ethnic towards the social and other important issues of society. I think once we have these three different strategies which are connected and alternative routes, then we have the potential for new third spaces. But we really, we really need to think seriously what is the nature of the public sphere we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole.